thank you. Uh, unwitting product placement. I need to put it down somewhere. There. Hello. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I am always, this is the third time I've got to do it, and each time I feel like a kid who somebody said, here is the key to the biggest candy store in the world. Um, take anything you like, just don't make yourself sick. I have no idea where that's going, I, I, it, but it's, it's that kind of... The delight in getting to talk yeah. to Laurie Anderson. <laughs> that went a nice direction. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I really, I, this is our third conversation. Yeah. And um, they've been really in different contexts too. They, the Rubin Museum was, 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 was. The first one was the Rubin Museum where we got to talk about ignorance. Yeah. And it turns out we, we both know lots about ignorance. <laughs> so we, we were good at that one. Stupidity as well. And, and then we went to Bard College, where I am an occasional professor. And uh, that, was more, that was more like a regular kind of interview, except it kept going off into odd places. It wasn't and, so regular. And, and you kept asking questions. So, and this one um, is, we, we sat there backstage going, okay, what are we going to talk about? And Laurie said, what do you want to talk about? And I started saying, well, well families. And, and love and the imagination. What do you want to talk about? And we, we sort of put together our list of things. Um, so I don't think it's going to be like any conversation we've had before. Um, good, good, that's good. And, and we're definitely going to have some time for you to read. Is it chapter one? I, it's, I, I think it's North a North. chapter, a. The, the shortest. Okay. Because <laughs> we don't have as much time as we would like from Norse mythology. Um, so, I want to know about your new book before, before anything else. Um, things we lost in the flood. What is it? What kind this of is a, it's a list of things, actually. It's kind of an inventory. What happened was um, Hurricane Sandy hit, and we were so unprepared for hurricanes. Came up, uh, the Hudson came up and um, through the park, Across the highway, I'm watching this like a, um, uh, it was so dramatic, and then came up our street, and uh, it was very beautiful. It flooded my basement, where everything, all my archive was. Now, um, the Hudson is an estuary, so it's mostly salt water, so salt water pulverizes everything. So I went over to fish out the things I thought I could get, and uh, and it had all turned to oatmeal. Just electronics, props, sculpture, um, projectors, everything. And, and I, it, I was devastated. It, it was two days though, two days later, when I realized I never have to clean the basement. <laughs> <laughs> and I was then, probably a day or two after that, I'm reading the list of things in there. And uh, it was pretty complete, you know, this, all, the, all these words about all these things. And I thought, you know, this list is, is better than having a basement full of things. And um, uh, so I, I uh, was, was, that was my motivation for, for writing the book. And that stories and language can stand for things. And so it starts off, the, you know, in a kind of ponderous way of the way the word yellow uh, is a kind of a memorial to the color yellow. And so that, because it's all happening in our minds anyway, so as you know, you conjure these things. And so when you were talking about um, the imagination, uh, I, I think that's what I began to think about as, as we live in a, in a less material culture too, as things get, um, as so many different things begin to disappear, record stores, bookstores, banks, you know, uh, and everything is in our phones and so we have, these, this live in a world of representation. So that was um, kind of what I was was basing it on. So when you're, uh, uh, you're the title of your book, Norse myth mythology, is uh, is um, uh, really ringing a lot of bells for me because you know not only do uh, do I live in a world of um, uh, kind of representation, but also. Um, 
most of the people I know in some way are mythologizing themselves, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and, and I certainly come from a family that was doing that, a Norse family that was doing that. So Norse mythology, this looks like my, my uh, family scrapbook. <laughs> you, you mentioned um, very mysteriously uh, when we were backstage your grandfather, your Swedish grandfather, and, and you alluded to him. And I thought, okay, I have to ask her when we're on stage. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, this is a, uh, has a few twists to it. Uh, this is a grandfather who uh, always, the family mythology was that he, his story was that he'd come from Sweden when he was eight by himself and that he'd started a horse business when he was nine and gotten married when he was 10. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, yeah, and fishy. And uh, so... He was speaking Swedish, which led people to think he's probably from Sweden, you know, so. Um, uh, you know, I, I just had this feeling that maybe though the story was darker than that, uh, and that it was a story he couldn't really tell. Um, that maybe he was an orphan or like a lot of, like a lot of kids, uh, um, Swedish kids, um, has a very violent uh, time in the late 19th century when he came and I could picture him as a runaway or a stowaway and that the story was not as quite as happy as the one he um, pictured. And then, but that was always the story I was going with, you know. And then um, recently in working on another project, I, I was doing a little research on him and I found out that he had, um, he had come with his parents. He, he made the whole thing up. The whole thing came when he was a little boy two or three, and uh, that his mother had died when he was seven, and that his father put him into an orphanage, because he didn't, he had a bunch of little kids, he doesn't know what to do, and, and little Axel, my grandfather, kept running away, and then, um, and then his father had put him in prison from the time he was 12 to 21. He put him in prison, and um, in a in a place in Minnesota called Red Wing Correctional, um, which Bob Dylan wrote a song about. Um, a very, very tough place for a kid to be. And, um, and his, uh, so that his, his father was, um, uh, his profession was listed, I, so I got a lot of, um, I got all of the prison documents from this uh, correctional place. And, and his, his, fa his father's profession is listed as a uh, drunkard. Professional drunk. Professional drunkard, yeah. So uh, it was a lot sadder than what I had thought. Although it kind of explains why he would want to reinvent himself yeah. parentless. Yeah. To delete the parents. Yeah. Came by himself. Self-made man. He, he actually did very well after he got out of prison. He, he became, he, he was a, a very sturdy um, survivor. And a, like a lot of Swedes are pretty sturdy, you know. They're, I mean, or, or at least that's part of my family mythology of, of being um, uh, kind of a, uh, practical, I guess. You know, our our church was a Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant Church, and it was a, basically like a coffee church. So we would, you know, listen to sermons, and uh, people would say, "It's good to be nice to people." That was the sermon. You know, <laughs> you're going to get a lot out of that, and it will be good for you. So, and then you, then you, after that, you'd go down to the fellowship room and you'd get super wired on coffee. You're just, <laughs> you know. So the rest of the day, everyone was <laughs> jacked out of their minds. But anyway, that was um, uh, that was our our uh, our belief system, I guess. You know, just very practical and just be good and drink a lot of coffee. And my, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, um, arrived in England, I think he was about 11. And from? From, uh, I think he was born in Poland, but he came in from Belgium, okay. where my great-grandfather had been working on the diamond bourse as a diamond uh, person who carried diamonds from one jewelry dealer to another. And either, there are two versions of the story. Either he lost a diamond and fled to England. Ooh, 
yeah. or he stole a diamond and fled to England. <laughs> um, but he seems to have been very shady, my great-grandfather. And my grandfather, age 11, really was bringing up the family. And, you know, he was working as a bellboy in a hotel. Enterprising at 11? Um, incredibly enterprising. Uh, wow. Got busted by the... Uh, by uh, the people running the hotel for selling alcohol to American servicemen during World War I, <laughs> uh, which he would bring in his own whiskey, and they explained that that was, that was out of the question. He was, and I discovered recently that he was known as Belgian Mori, which I rather like, so, yeah. sort of a, like a Damon Runyon kind yeah, of Yeah, a very sporty name. Yes. Uh, did you know him? I, I knew him, but I knew him in his later years after he had become... Uh, due to a, a variety of peculiar circumstances, he was briefly the most successful uh, grocer in Portsmouth in England and uh, had several groceries and it was very big. Um, and then went kind of mad and lost it all. Um, what happened to him? He, I, the, the details are shrouded in family, uh, you know, it's that kind of thing when, when I ask, so what exactly happened? And there's sort of, there are pauses. And then people say, well, he crashed his car. And you go, well, hang on, crashed his car? That, well, that doesn't mean anything. What, what exactly happened? Well, nerves. And you go, I don't know what nerves means either. I think I, I actually... Um, need to take a, I need to go and take a, a tape recorder and talk to surviving members of the family about what they remember. But, th their stories always contradict each other. You know, I, I remember an amazing conversation once during a, uh, a family, I think it was during a wedding, where I asked about my uncle Monty, who was a hunchback. And I said, so why was, why was Uncle Monty, he was this tiny little hunchback man, I said, why, why was he a hunchback? And uh, one of them said, oh, he had, uh, he had polio uh, as, a, as a child. The other one said, no, he didn't have polio as a child. He was thrown out of a window. <laughs> and then the first one says, no, 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 you're thinking of the twins. <laughs> the twin got thrown down the stairs and he died. And you're going, I, it all got tremendously dark. And in the way that only families can. There's sort of, so yes, I need to go and, and investigate. Too. See that as a graphic novel I, out, out the window. It could be. So, families and loss. Um, how do you cope when people aren't around anymore? Well, I, I think they are around. I mean, I know my grandfather Axel is around. I think people are around. Um, I, I just wrote a, some music for a, a, a teacher of mine, for a, a sculpture teacher named Saul LeWitt, who, and who I really loved so much. And he had he had, did this number series, and I thought that looks like a score for a quartet. And so, he, can I do a quartet um, based on that? And I did, and. Um, it's about 25 minutes of quarter notes. It's very, very peaceful, very, very beautiful, actually. And, um, and very kind of unpredictable. And, and we played it in, in the middle uh, of his paintings at Mass Mocha last spring, uh, where a lot of his work is. And I don't believe in ghosts, but Saul showed up. And there he was. And, I mean, maybe it's like music and numbers or something, some frequency that other creatures are on. But anyway, um, so uh, I, I, uh, I don't know why I brought up Saul as a family member, but I guess he was kind of, uh, I, I kind of felt um, like that about, about him. But maybe most of my teachers feel like relatives. You know, I'm, I feel a, a real rapport with them. You know, you were saying you you've been writing more and more pieces for real people. Well, that's the the premise of something that I'm going to do uh, next year in San Francisco. Um, I just really envy um, you know composers who are sitting there at the piano and they have all of these framed pictures on the on the uh, on the piano of their 
uh, of their dog and their granny and their, you know, everybody, and they just kind of play and think of those people. And, and I don't really do that. Do you do that in your, in your writing? Do you have pi pictures posted in your writing room of people that you know? No. no. I've, I've occasionally written things for real people. Yeah. Um, only family and yeah. that I can think of and normally my kids because I'll go, I, I will write this story for you and yeah. you will enjoy it. I will write Caroline was written for my daughters because I thought they'd like it. Um, but no photos, no actual, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. none of that sort of thing of I will write. You know, like occasionally, um, occasionally when people are dead, Kathy Acker was a friend and when she died, I, I wrote a little memorial piece for her. Um, but, it's, but it's very rare for me to do that. A couple of nights I sat across from a puppet of Kathy Acker. Someone had, um, it was a Henson pu puppet and somebody had brought it to this dinner party and she was sitting there doing kind of <laughs> Kathy Acker-like motions. It was so unnerving. I really don't like puppetry very much at all. I so, and puppetry of my friends, you know, like, <laughs> some of my friends have turned into other things. Havel is an airport. Vaslav Havel was, yep. was our friend, and he is now an airport. Uh, I guess there's worse things to be, but... You know. I would rather be an airport than a puppet. <laughs> yeah. If I were given Puppetry the choice. Puppetry is, is risky. It is. I, actually, I, I, I say that I actually am, or I was for a while. I've probably grown old now and, and been retired to a back room. But the Atlanta Center for Puppetry Arts used to have a Neil Gaiman that they used as a narrator, as a storyteller. Nice. Which was cool. Although um, old, old Muppets are really scary. I, I once, yeah. in 2002, I stayed, Dave McKean and I stayed in Jim Henson's old house um, in, in Highgate in England, and in Hampstead. And they hadn't touched the house. The family really had done nothing to touch the house since Jim died. Um, and even then, it was very old and strange, um, you know, from the days when the family were living there while they were making the Muppet Show. And there was a box in the basement of old Muppets. And my immediate reaction was, I, Muppets, I have to put on Muppets. I have to put Muppets on, and, and you know, I grab a Muppet sheep and I put it on and I, I go, ah, and if I do this, I can make the eyes open and close. And, and I close the eyes and the latex on the eye just rotted. <laughs> and just the eyelid just fell apart. And it was one of the most horrific things. <laughs> Old but puppets are dangerous. There's a story um, in this book about, about that. And there's a, uh, a, a, per, a journalist who wanted to come over to my house to... Uh, do an interview, and I really hate that because because there's almost never enough time to hide all the things in your house that you really need to hide if a journalist is coming over. So she came over and she started the interview, and then she she said, "Wait a second, I didn't put my uh, she put a sock on her hand, and she started like, do you mind if we do the interview with this?" <laughs> and I was looking at the sock puppet, and I was like, I was looking at the sock puppet a little too long. No, and uh, she was a very bad puppeteer too. So everything was pretty much off, you know. And uh, so I said, "Wait a second, I'm I'm going to, you know, everyone has a uh, spare sock around, you know." So I went and got one and and said, "Okay, uh, I'm ready." So we did this, you know, <laughs> uh, whole interview with two sock puppets, which was. <laughs> Very nice, because you don't have to take responsibility for what you just said. I mean, that's what puppetry is. Oh, it, you know, Amanda and I um, have occasionally, during marital rows, um, resorted to sock puppets. Um, and actually, you know, when you put on a sock puppet and they're having the row for you, everything gets a lot sillier. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it kind of frees you up to yeah. not actually mind what's being said in the row, you're sort of going, okay, well. Um, so yes, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the use of therapeutic sock puppets for, but not in interviews. That just seems wrong. Well, I, I had, I was, I mentioned that I had um, 
invented a kind of puppet, a, a video puppet, um, because I had um, worked on some um, uh, ways to change my voice that, uh, because it, it's, it's, um, you get so sick of the sound of your own voice, don't you? Do you? Um, you know, <laughs> Maybe you don't. yes, but I don't get to listen to it very much. I mean, the, the, it's the nice really, thing about not, not being... I'll do an audio book here and there, right. and I'll do a couple of readings, but I don't get to go out and perform with my voice on a regular basis, right, right. which is a different kind of thing. But I, I mean, I've heard you do some of the glorious weird stuff where suddenly you're changing your voice and you're a man or... Well, that is really fun to do dr audio drag. That's very, very nice because it gives you a chance to just be... Uh, have, if, you, if you sound radically different, you're really going to start having different uh, thoughts and you're going to start phrasing things differently. So um, we... Let, let me see if I can find this thing and we're going to have to flip through a bunch of things really quickly. Um, blip, blip, some pictures from the, this book. Uh, oh, so this is this puppet that I made. And um, it was with a very old uh, video trick from the 80s of squeezing the frame like this so the top of the frame would be big and the bottom would be small. And I was working with this voice that was a guy kind of like that. <clears throat> and and uh, uh, I thought, what is the, I wonder what that guy looks like. So that's why I, why I did this. I made this. And here is his first appearance on a talk show um, as a character. So you've been pretty busy for a multimedia performance artist. Let's see. I hear you make uh, records, films, books, and you've been on the road a lot too, haven't you? Yeah. Uh Actually, I, I just got back from a, a concert tour, Japan and Europe, Australia. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And yeah, I'll be making a, another record soon, but lately I've been so busy doing press, mm -hmm. you know, interviews mm -hmm. and photo sessions mm -hmm. and talk shows like this one that, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have the time anymore to do the actual work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, you can't be in two places at once. Right. I mean, you, you wish there was another you. Yeah. So I, I, I talked to a, a design team about it, and, mm -hmm. I mean, cloning is uh, in, still in very early stages, but I, I think we did a, a, pretty, a pretty good job, and uh, we were dealing with uh, duplicating speech and a certain musical ability, and... Uh, Logic. Interesting. And a few things came out sort of strange, but then I think it's always strange to see some kind of reflection of yourself. And anyway, we do work together, and, and sometimes he's on his own, but I, I think it's working out really well, don't you? Uh, well, I... I, I, write, I write the music, and... Uh, it's a uh, pretty interesting work, really. Uh, she does most of the words. Well, I mean, you've, you've been writing. Well, some. No, I mean, it's been really good. It really has been good. Well, uh, most of the time I'm not really, I'm not really sure what I'm writing about, but uh, I, I, I keep, I keep, <coughs> I keep busy, you know, I, 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 keep, I keep writing, writing. And, I mean, eventually you're, you're going to be doing even more, even more things. Uh, um, actually, I didn't realize the time. I, uh, look, I've got to uh, get to a, a photo session, so um, I've really got to go. Listen, you can do? you um, just uh, take over for me, because... Uh, Great, uh, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Great. I'm really sorry.
So that's the alter ego. Would you read this chapter, please? This vision of everybody in the audience going, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen happen on a stage. Yes. I will do a very short chapter. And this is called Mimir's Head and Odin's Eye. In Jotunheim, the home of the giants, is Mimir's well. It bubbles up from deep in the ground, and it feeds Yggdrasil, the world tree. Mimir, the wise one, the guardian of memory, knows many things. His well is wisdom. And when the world was young, he would drink every morning from the well by dipping the horn, known as the Gjallarhorn, into the water and draining it. Long, long ago, when the worlds were young, Odin put on his long cloak and his hat, and in the guise of a wanderer, he traveled through the land of the giants, risking his life to get to Mimir to seek wisdom. One drink from the water of your well, Uncle Mimir, said Odin. That is all I ask for. Mimir shook his head. Nobody drank from the well but Mimir himself. He said nothing. Seldom do those who are silent make mistakes. I am your nephew, said Odin. My mother, Bestla, was your sister. That is not enough, said Mimir. One drink, with a drink from your well, Mimir, I will be wise, name your price. Your eye is my price, said Mimir, your eye in the pool. Odin did not ask if he was joking. The journey through giant country to get to Mimir's well had been long and dangerous. Odin had been willing to risk his life to get there. He was willing to do more than that for the wisdom he sought. Odin's face was set. Give me a knife, was all he said. After he had done what was needful, he placed his eye carefully in the pool. It stared up at him through the water. Odin filled the gjallarhorn with water from Mimir's pool and he lifted it to his lips. The water was cold. He drained it down. Wisdom flooded into him. He saw farther and more clearly with his one eye than he ever had with two. Thereafter, Odin was given other names. Blinda, they called him, the blind god, and Hoa, the one-eyed, and Baleg, the flaming-eyed one. Odin's eye remains in Mimir's well, preserved by the waters that feed the world ash, seeing nothing, seeing everything. Time passed. When the war between the Aesir and the Vanir was ending, and they were exchanging warriors and chiefs, Odin sent Mimir to the Vanir as an advisor to the Aesir god Honir, who would be the new chief of the Vanir. Honir was tall and good-looking, and he looked like a king. When Mimir was with him to advise him, Honir also spoke like a king and made wise decisions. But when Mimir was not with him, Honir seemed unable to come to a decision, and the Vanir soon tired of this. They took their revenge, not on Honir, but on Mimir. They cut off Mimir's head and sent it to Odin. Odin was not angry. He rubbed Mimir's head with certain herbs to prevent it from rotting, and he chanted charms and incantations over it, for he did not wish Mimir's knowledge to be lost. Soon enough, Mimir opened his eyes and spoke to him. Mimir's advice was good, as it was always good. Odin took Mimir's head back to the well beneath the world tree, and he placed it there beside his eye in the waters of knowledge of the future and of the past. Odin gave the Gjallarhorn to Hemdal, watchman of the gods. On the day the Gjallarhorn is blown, it will wake the gods, no matter where they are, no matter how deeply they sleep. Hemdal will blow the Gjallarhorn only once at the end of all things, at Ragnarok. Whoa, that's, <laughs> that's, that's frightening. That's, that's a, what did you start with in that story? I um, started with the fact that there were two stories of Mimir, and I needed to figure out how you could tell both of them. Um, 
and they're, they're slightly contradictory because one is from the sort of the, the, the sort of the, the mythic side of things, which is the story of Odin cutting out his eye. And one is from the slightly more practical version of the Norse myths, um, in which it is kind of assumed that these are stories about things that happened to men at some point. Um, so it was a matter with that one of what trying to... What do you mean to, by that? I mean that in post-Christian Iceland, um, one of the techniques for telling the old myths was to preface your myth with essentially... Well, obviously, these are sort of called gods and things, but really we're just talking about people so that you don't get into enormous trouble for having told uh, stories of ancient gods. Some of the stories we get are god stories, and some of them are gods as people. And you kind of, on those ones, you kind of wind up going in and, and removing the as peopleness of them. Um, but, I mean, in terms of writing the myths, it was absolutely fascinating going in and going to Snorri, mm -hmm. um, who is, is, we only have a very, very small amount of information about the Norse myths, about the Norse gods, um, and an awful lot of it we owe to a man called Snorri. And Snorri was a politician, Snorri was a poet, um, Snorri was somebody who decided that one of the important things he needed to do was tell the stories of the gods, mostly in order that Norse poetry and Icelandic poetry would be comprehensible. Would, be, com would be comprehensible, because in, um, in Norse poetry, you have things called kennings. And a kenning is basically, a, a, it's a metaphor, it's a simile. Um, a simple one would be calling the sea the whale road, for example. Um, but there were a lot of kennings that were less obvious than that, and ones that in order to understand what they were, you needed to understand the story that they came from. You know, gold could be Freya's ransom or whatever. And so you, you needed to know the stories for the poets to understand the old poems. And that was one of the things that Snorri was actually out to preserve. So who were the Icelanders in relationship to their gods? Because you're saying, in a way, they were the poets, uh, the creators of them, obviously. But they, they, they had a relationship that was very different to the rest of the Scandin of, of Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the gods, the Norse gods sort of come up from northern Germany and they, they wander off into Denmark and up into Sweden and Norway and, and stuff. But when they get to Iceland, they kind of find a home. Um, the, the people of Iceland actually... Um, believed in their gods, uh, resisted the arrival of Christianity for a lot longer than the rest of Scandinavia. And, and when they did it, uh, they decided to become uh, Christian. It was done by actually basically deciding who the wisest man in Iceland was, who happened to be a pagan and saying to him, okay, you, you've got the job of figuring this one out. Of, 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 of figuring out oh. whether we uh, continue to be pagan or whether we become Christian. Mm -hmm. And he went off, gave it a good think for several days and came back and said, now we're Christian. But even with that, um, being Icelandic, they had their own set of rules that were slightly different to anybody else's. I, I love the fact that, I still think about this one, um, in the rest of Scandinavia, worshipping pagan gods was illegal. 
you know, Christianity was the religion and it was illegal to worship pagan gods. In Iceland, it was only illegal if they caught you. It was not, as long as you got away with it, 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 it had not been illegal. But these, these gods were, were full of wisdom, right? I mean, kind of, because it just strikes me as like, like the polar opposite of, of the Greeks, because uh, the, the Greek gods were also uh, beautiful and so on, but they were also uh, jealous and crazy and uh, uh, really, really impulsive. And at the, at the same time, the humans were inventing everything. Philosophy, geography, physics, poetry, history. They were, they were godlike. And yet the gods, their puppets, were really misbehaving. You know, they were really just like I think having they had, affairs I think with partly everybody, the gods, chopping their heads off. And, they had a lot of time on their hands, yeah. which you do not feel like the Norse gods had. And also, really? they had fantastic they weather. Um, yeah. You know, you, and there are no Norse gods who ever do things like, you know, sort of stare into pools naked and fall in love with their own reflection, because this is Scandinavia. You will freeze. Yeah. If you tried it on one of those very, very rare warm summer's days, you'll get covered in mosquitoes. So these are gods in a hurry. Yes. Um, and, and so I think you, you, you get a much darker sort of worldview. Everything, there's frost giants out at the end of things. There's um, a, a culture that is based around the idea of having a good death. And a good death is death in battle. Um, and then, of course, it all leads up to Ragnarok, the idea that at some point, unspecified, and you're never even sure if it's in the past or the future, everything is going to go up in flames. The end of the world is coming. You're writing a TV thing about the end of the world now, right? I, I, but but I it am. has a good ending? I, I've, that... I've, well, I've made it. It's called Good Omens. Yep. Um, we, we've shot, we've done all of the principal photography. And uh, we have maybe three or four days worth of things we still need to shoot. And we've got about eight months of uh, a post-production to do. And uh, that, I, I made it, well, I made it A, because I um, wrote the novel, Good Omens, with, with a writer named Terry Pratchett um, about 30 years ago. And Terry had Alzheimer's. He had a premature, horrible, rare form of Alzheimer's. And as it became obvious to him that we weren't going to find somebody else to do it, he, um, he did the last request thing of me, which is a dirty trick, frankly, to play on anybody. They sort of like, you have to do this, and I'm going to die. Because you go, hang on, my friend just gave me this thing to do, and oh, he's dead. Okay, that was a last request. Yeah, I have to do this. And so I, I, it's sort of taken over my life. Um, it's, it will be coming out next year from Amazon, and when it's, it's the BBC and Amazon are making it together. So it'll come out first on Amazon Prime Video and then six months later from the BBC. So speaking of godlike, you've created a good end to the world. Well, it, it is, I like to describe it to people as the funniest story ever written about the end of the world and how we're all gonna die. Um, <laughs> but it, it's actually, it's really about avoiding Armageddon. It's about avoiding war. Um, it's about ways of not fighting. Um, ways of not ending the world, because sometimes, frankly, especially now, um, you sort of look around and you go, there are, there are actually people out there who either think some kind of doomsday scenario is winnable, or they think they'll give it a good try anyway. Um, and, uh, and you sort of go, no, actually, not, not fighting is infinitely superior to fighting. If there's anything that half a million years of being a human species has taught us, it is that talking your way through things, making art, 
So how can you attract people? Because, I mean, violence, and as you were saying, the boom factor is exciting. And uh, if you if you present another mode, how do you keep people interested? Well, things definitely do go boom. I mean, we had a very hard-working explosives expert who got okay, to good. blow up several things, including a 1920s vintage Bentley. Okay. Um, and but no one gets hurt, gets hurt. Well, there, there are some telephone salespeople who get eaten by giant maggots. Telephone. I mean, there's... there's <laughs> You know, a few people get hurt, um, but it, it, it was an attempt. It, it's really just an attempt uh, by an angel and a demon played by Michael Sheen and David Tennant to, um, to keep the earth going rather than head for the inevitable apocalypse, which both heaven and hell seem determined to happen uh, because they've been living on earth for 6,000 years and they like it here and you can't get sushi in heaven. Um, it is news to me. It's exact. I hope when you go to heaven, there will be sushi waiting for you. That will be wonderful. Thank you. Hello, here is your sushi. <laughs> and then you've got all these ghostly fish swimming around going, it's for you. I gave you my stomach. <laughs> we were you going to have some questions from here. I was going to say, we, we, we're meant to have questions from the audience. Should yeah. we, uh, I, I really like that part. If, it, if people would like to talk, maybe we should have some more lights. Let's, yes, give us some lights so we whoever can you are. see there's a hand there. And then we will repeat your question from the stage because anybody watching this on the live stream will think that we are answering non-existent questions. So yes, you go first. Um, it's, it's funny that you were discussing voices. No, no, Cat, Cat Stevens, I love the idea that I, I have the same voice as Cat Stevens. He has a marvelous voice. Uh, Alan Rickman is the one that I normally get, um, which made being introduced to Alan Rickman once very, very awkward. Um, but um, I, I love the fact that voices, our voices do remind us of other people. Um, have, have you ever, with 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 your sort of your vocal drag, tricks, 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 yes, your, yes. your 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 personas that you create with with voice, have any of them ever surprised you? Have you ever wound up saying anything through another voice you could never have said through your own? Oh, absolutely, and especially the little squeaky voices, and and uh, they are yeah, absolutely have a lot of things to say. That if you're like don't you make that like a sort of like stuffed animal, yeah. <laughs> have a lot of things, different things to say. Um, so, and I, I do try to um, not write things down, but just sort of talk, and then eventually, sort of like transcribe. What about some more questions? Other hand, yes, yes. You looking around desperately. Um, so I was just going to say that the uh, subject of families and loss is really poignant to me right now. I lost my parents and I had to sell my childhood home recently. And all of that loss sort of makes me feel very untethered. And I wondered, how do you tether? So the question was, um, the, the question was saying that loss and family loss is very important. She just lost her parents and had to sell a beloved family home and is feeling untethered. How, how do you tether? How do you tether? I try not to tether. I try to appreciate being untethered. And uh, one of the things that, that I've learned uh, in um, the world of virtual reality is, which I, I'm really geeking out on, uh, is that you, you cut that uh, um, cord to, to sort of who you are and where you think you are. And it's just wonderful. And it's um, so uh, making a lot of spaces where you can um, uh, find. Well, actually, you know, say I take take your picture, and you're like, mm -hmm. you're like that that that's not me. 
I, I'm not, it's not possible for you to take my picture because I'm the one in here looking out. That's who I am. And that's who you are in, in VR. You're free of all that stuff. Everything I've ever made has been to be, uh, uh, to, to feel disembodied. And uh, so, uh, or to get lost. Mm -hmm. And not to be tethered. So, I mean, and lost in, this, in the way that you can get lost in a book of Norse mythology, or you can get lost in a pencil drawing, or can get lost in a piece of music. Lost in another world that isn't, isn't yours with all your specific memories and, and uh, ways of looking at things. So I would, if you can possibly try, uh, not to tether yourself up right away. It, would, it might be interesting for you to suddenly get this feeling of look behind you and around and then it's a, it's a whole, you know, that, that door doesn't open very often in your life when you get the chance to do that. So I'd make the most of that. That's a, a big privilege that you have. Some other At the back, over there. Yes. <laughs> so I, I work in video production, and I've been asking some people recently, you know, where do they think VR is going? Is it popular? Is it getting more popular, or is it, you know, just a fad? And I, but then I see like a lot of the younger people online and gamers, like they're taking VR to a, a place that I think the older generation can't see, or it doesn't. Like, where do you think um, the future is for VR? Is the younger generation taking it? Yeah, the question is, where, what's the future of VR? Is it games and video, or uh, who will be doing it? I, I think everyone will be doing it, um, who, uh, uh, unless you're really gonna, uh, about to fall over, because uh, it, it is a little bit scary, because your eyes rule in that world, you know? Your, your eyes, uh, your feet tell you, I'm in a room, I'm have these geeky glasses on, and, but your eyes tell you, I'm on a pillar, in about a foot by foot uh, square, and it's 100 miles up, and I'm gonna fall, and you fall. And it's, it's, it's wild, your eyes totally rule. And so you can start playing with your senses in ways that, that, you, that 21st century people already know how to do very well, because you're always uh, deciding whether you're gonna trust your eyes or your ears. Um, if you're talking to someone who's going, God, I love your new book. And you know from the way their, their body language, they hate your new book. <laughs> you know, so what, you're always kind of going, okay, yeah, I know, is what he's saying or what he's looking like, you know, you're always like judging those things. VR, you have a million new ways to do it. Uh, I'm not saying that you can't do all of this stuff in flat film or other ways that, you know, we make images, but I, I really do think that walking inside an image is is going to be the future of of imagery and music too. Uh, so that uh, and that's that's something I'm just starting to experiment with, and it's really uh, I have no idea how it works. A piece of music that doesn't have a beginning, a middle, or an end. It is not a narrative, but it's a spatial thing. So it's it's truly um, exhilarating to try to think of how to do that. So, yeah, I think it has a, a big future, and uh, that, it, that it won't in any way, uh, of course, eclipse all of the other art forms, but I, I think it will be really interesting to see where it's going. One of my um, children's books, called The Wolves in the Walls, is currently being turned into a, a VR thing, and they, they rolled out the first 10, 15 minutes of it to, at South By. Um, and when I was last in Seattle, the people who were doing it came over and, and said, we just want to show you stuff. And the most impressive thing that I got to do was play with a vert, put on a, a glove, and um, in the virtual world, pick up a tool which when squeezed would extrude a virtual foam mm -hmm. that weighed nothing. And I was able to change its color, I was able to sculpt it, change and create, create weightless sculptures. And um, there was definitely sort of that looking at it and going, I almost, 
I mean, you were asking about young people. Um, and it, it definitely felt for me like the kind of thing where the people who are actually going to show you what this can do have not yet turned up. Um, that we will come into it and we will create things that are in some ways influenced by things that have gone before. Absolutely. It has all the great storytelling elements so that you can create doubt and fear. There's one section in the, in the work that I, I just did, of, in <clears throat> which you're, you're just reading the end of Crime and Punishment and, and, and you bring up your virtual hands and they're, they're covered with blood and you're like, and then you're like, whoa, whoa, and then suddenly, boom, a knife goes down, it falls into your hand and you're like, did, did I do this? And then, then you put your hands down and the next time you bring them up, they're hooves, and you're like, hooves? Ho hooves, why do I have hooves? And they work like this, and you're like, whoa. And uh, the, uh, I'll just tell you the, the plot of one short one that was called heart surgery. Heart surgery is you're strapped in a gurney like this, you're shooting down a hall, you're really, your vision is restrained, and your two doors open up really fast, and you're, the gurney parks in the corner, and then you see these people over there in the dark sharpening these knives and talking about the heart surgery, the heart. And you really just, they're talking about my heart surgery. These lights come down suddenly, really bright lights, and then guys in masks and come down, the surgeons, and, and then this comes towards you, and <sighs> things are getting blurry, and <sighs> then, then they make the first cut, they take the, your heart, you put it on your, your uh, chest, and it's, dun, 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 and you're like, oh man. And then then uh, suddenly the, the surgeon just uh, goes, oh wow, you know, I, I gotta go. And he, <laughs> he leaves. He and his whole team leave, they just leave. And you're, you're there, you're like, and uh, about a minute goes by, and you hear the door kind of open, and you hear the footsteps come in. Then I come over to the, bed and I start talking and telling you a very uh, long kind of a complicated story in your ear. And you're like, not the right time for a long complicated story, <laughs> really. <laughs> so you can literally rip someone's heart out. You can do all kinds of things with VR that you just can't do in other media, so, I, <laughs> you know, it's really, really create. it uses all those, the great dramatic tricks of fear and doubt and, and, um, and, and makes them very, very, very visceral. So, I mean, at the moment, you know, it's probably now the, you know, the early moments of, of film where the train's coming towards everyone, ah, you know, so, um, eventually, We'll, we'll be more used to it and, and the story itself will have to take over and the surprise element will be a little more tempered. One of, one of the things I find most interesting about VR is even not terribly good VR. Um, you know, you'd be shooting at monsters wearing a haptic vest and, and things are coming at you and, and stuff like that. But it doesn't register as it, it isn't sitting there in my head as something that happened outside of me in the same way that TV or film or theater or whatever is. It, it, it registers as something I was there for. Yeah. When I remember it, I remember it as, yes, I was in this place, I was doing this thing. Even if things were slightly fuzzy and pixelated, I was there doing this thing. I, yeah, I think most of the VR, when I first started doing it, I really didn't, want to do it because I, I don't like the way the visual world of VR, it's bright, it's flat, it's people look like they're made of rubber in a very unpleasant way, you know, it's just not very visually appealing. But uh, so I, I just realized if I could make something that had atmosphere and darkness and something more uh, handmade than, than trying to be uh, so-called realistic, and it wasn't game-oriented. It has nothing to do with targets or, or shooting. Somebody else, over there, yes. Both of you have worked with so many different mediums and so many different topics. I imagine you have wild imagination. How do you decide what is a flight of fancy and what is your next VR 
you are experienced. How do we decide? Both of us have wild imaginations. I think that is more or less true. Um, how do we decide what is just a flight of fancy or a wild notion and what we're going to make art out of? Um, I, I'm not sure you get to decide. Normally what happens is an idea, well for me at least, an idea takes root and it doesn't leave and it hangs around and it starts accreting other things to it. You know, you can have an idea that's just a kind of weird, lovely notion, and you go, oh, that's just a, that's a lovely, weird notion, and then it, it fades away and you forget about it. But then it's the ones where they have legs, and all of a sudden you realize that this idea is a bigger thing than you thought it was, and it feels more real, and it concatenates. Um, what about the so-called real world? Does that influence the things that you're you're writing and in your imaginary world? Absolutely, and and I think if you're doing fantasy right, it ought to be a conversation between the real world and the fantastic, um, and not necessarily a comfortable conversation. You can you can. Um, I wrote a novel called The Ocean at the End of the Lane, which in many ways was my sort of attempt to come to terms with untethering, um, to come to terms with the fact that my childhood home no longer exists, that there are places that I can no longer take people to show them to say this is where I grew up because they just aren't there anymore. Um, and trying to explain to my wife, Amanda, what it was like to be me age seven, grew into a story which is filled with strange and fantastical elements. But I hope at its core is really all about what it was like to be me age seven, because that was, that was the gift that I wanted to give Amanda. I think for, for me, I, I can um, be very influenced by things that are going on and and maybe also anger is is something that that will just kind of eat away at me, and then I until I can't push it away, I then it starts getting into into my work, and and particularly um, issues of violence, I think. So uh, how vi how very very violent uh, life is now, and so that that's pushing. Uh, on me, and I, I, I sometimes don't know what to do with it. Sometimes I just want to uh, deal with it in a very realistic way, or in a in a in a, a way that asks people to be very specific. I mean, for for example, we supposedly live in a very information-rich culture where we can get you know anything uh, at any time, but. With all these um, shootings, uh, with uh, in in schools, for example, I mean that's such a dominant theme in in our in our country now. It's a it's a, it's a uh, weekly ritual, and uh, I'm just thinking uh, of of trying to think of how people can uh, show up for for something like that. And I'm, and I'm thinking like right now, how come? There aren't any doctors who are holding up pictures of, of what those guns do to human bodies. We have this kind of vague idea about bullets and weapons, but nothing very specific. So that you know, when people get shot, it is not like ah, you're getting shot like uh, in the Wild West, and you get Doc so and so to come over to the hotel, and you drink a whiskey, and he pries it out of your shoulder, and you go, there it is, bullet clink, you know, puts it in the pan. These, these weapons, when they blast through your body, they blast to make a hole this big on the way, their way out. They pulverize every organ in the way. When you get shot in the arm, there's no bone left with these weapons. How come we don't have any doctors who said, here's what this weapon will do to a body? You know, and so I, I just, you know, you know, live in a, a country of that's so full of stories, and everybody has these stories, and we think we we know so much, but 
uh, I, I think that um, I, one of the things that inspires me is just like looking at how little we do know and, and trying to think of how um, uh, I can think about that as an artist and, and um, uh, as, as a storyteller, really. So, uh, because I, I think in many ways we're, we're living in, in a extremely dark dream. <laughs> You know, I don't think it's, I think very, uh, people are pretty confused about what's real right now. Just so many layers of it that, and so many stories floating around about what's real, that it's, it becomes um, uh, a kind of, um, uh, basically I think we're, it's a kind of existential crisis, you know. We really don't know what's real. And we're drowning in our own stories. And, uh, and they're all getting wilder and wilder as we try to, you know, figure out, like, what, what it is that we're living in right now. It's just, don't you find that it's going awfully fast to, I mean, as a writer, in looking at, at the number of ways that people are trying to un define reality at the moment, it's, it's just mind-boggling. I, yeah, well, I think it is, it, it's mind-boggling. Partly it's mind-boggling because reality right now is incredibly unconvincing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any writer of fiction should be able to write a present day that is more likely um, mm -hmm. than the one we're in right now. It, it's like, yeah, here are the least, here's the least likely set of scenarios that we can possibly give you, and it's true. Mm -hmm. And you go, come on, there's somebody, it's we're in some kind of strange work of satire right now, aren't we? Somewhere they're having a perfectly normal world and laughing at us. I'd like to think that. What's happening in Trump world right now? Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, Sean Hannity. And you're just going, oh, I, can't, I don't even want to know this stuff. You know. So we're like a con kind of control group of some kind? <laughs> yes, we're the ones in the little test tube. Yeah. They're going, ah, oh, that one isn't Does working Does anyone out. have any answers to this or, or comments on this? <laughs> What's real? Any good theories? Inviting an audience at the 92nd Street Y to give their opinions on what's real is asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there is the one. nicest possible way. Hands are going up. Yes. control that, they said people can't see that anymore because they, they don't want to watch it and they're not going to support it. So what we do is we make it grayer and further and further away and then we can create our own story. So it's really not an evolution towards Trump, it's really an evolution to the control of the media sort of whitewashing what's going on. Where you look, you went now, you have an embedded reporter who can't take pictures appropriately of what's going on because they don't want you to see what's going on. And that's, so that's why you're more enjoyable. <laughs> more reality than television. So I thank both of you. <laughs> you are welcome. We, How can we summarize what we like you've just said? Uh, pictures of I'm not going to summarize it for the people on the live stream. They, that, was, that was beautiful. Yeah. And, and true yeah. and accurate. But <laughs> the people on the live stream will just have to go, I wonder what he said. <laughs> Why was there applause? Okay, I think we're into time for the last question. Well, last I think questions. just one thing, one yeah. comment about that, uh, and, and he, he did make a really wonderful point about um, pictures of war that we are not looking at anymore. We don't, they, they are, we no longer see anybody blown up. We see some caskets with flags on them and it's very, very sanitized. And, and also uh, his other point, I think, to paraphrase. Yeah. That's all you see. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, uh, a Fourth of July show, and um, the um, I think your other comment on the specialization of, of media is very very key to this, because uh, we we are kind of like medieval kings of just give me the good news, just tell me what's interesting at court today, you know I don't want to hear about anything out there that's happening with the peasants or in another country. I just want to know. The gossip at my in my own little world, you know, and then so what happens then is is that's all you know, and you have you have the slightest idea what's happening to people over there, and so it ends up with a a congress that if they were in this room and you were on one side and you were on the other, you'd be screaming at each other. It's it's really a mess. Talk about. Uh, dysfunctional families. This is, has really gotten to be a, 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 a shouting match, and, it, and I think it really is a crisis. I don't think it's a. Um, uh, I, I I don't know how, where this is going. It's a, it's really really a amazing moment to be, to be living through and 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 watching this happen. I don't think any of us do. It is it it's. Like I say, things feel unlikely enough right now to defy punditry. Um, you know, I look at I look at what's happening in the U.S. I look at the U.K. with Brexit, where you appear to have something going on that most of the country no longer wants to happen, and yet it's it's as if it's as if you've got people going, "Well, we voted to drive this truck off the cliff." And people are going, yeah, are you sure this is a good idea? Can we reconsider? And they're going, no, we're the drivers. You said, drive this cl truck off the cliff. And people are going, I, I, no, I, look, you know, can we at least slow down while we talk about it? No! And, uh, and um, it's a strange world. But there's an awful lot of wonderful stuff in it. Yeah. And the wonderful stuff continues to be wonderful. It's just, there are darker shadows. I love you, Neil. You're just always got that positive thing going on. <laughs> A world so in which great. I get described by Laurie Anderson as the positive one. <laughs> this is a good one. Okay, we have time for a last question. Make it good and make it relatively brief. Do not, <laughs> do not do that thing that people do sometimes when offered to do the last question where you stand up and you state your philosophy. Um, yes, over there. Hello. Um, since you're both artists who have touched me in very profound ways at perfect moments in my life, I would love to hear a moment like that that you have had where someone's art or words touched you at just the right time in a really profound way and sort of changed the way that you were seeing things. What a beautiful question. Yeah. Um, so, so the question uh, was, as, as we are artists whose work has touched you, has touched the questioner, um, what is an artist or a moment of art that we had individually um, which touched us profoundly or changed us, I think, profoundly? Because for me, those moments of great art kind of define into those ones where you go, I was not the same person before I experienced this art that I was afterwards. There was, there was a change. It wasn't just a touch. It's, it's like you're not quite the same person you were going into it. Do you have one? I have a few. Um, yes. Um, I mean, the, the, the first one for me would probably be aged... 10 or 11 years old and picking up Lord of the Rings and just not being the same person I was at the end of it, having, having gone on this strange journey and being someone different. Um, somewhere in my 20s, going into the Tate Gallery and seeing a painting called The Fairy Fellers Masterstroke by an English madman named Richard Dadd who painted the painting which isn't finished, it's still unfinished, over nine years in uh, Broadmoor, the maximum security asylum for 
um, mad people who had done terrible things in Victorian times. He'd murdered his father and was an astounding painter. And I just remember standing in front of this painting for what seemed like about 15 minutes and must actually have been pushing two or three hours, just lost in the details and trying to come up with stories for everything. There, there are like 40 or 50 characters in this painting and trying to, trying to understand it and feeling when I walked away that I wasn't the person who had arrived at it. Um, and also, I would throw one in which um, I, I feel kind of odd saying, but it's true. Lou Reed's Transformer, that album, I was not the same person after hearing it that I was before. It, it, it was that thing where this is, this is your record from the age of whatever I was, 13, 14, um, to the age of probably 2021, 20, that record got played more than anything else. And it was a place that I went, it was music, but it was sort of, and it wasn't just music, it was the idea that you could have songs that were somehow these ultra compact stories. And you didn't have to know the story, you could open it up. And, and it gave me a, different kind of idea as to what a story was. So that and the first few Velvet Underground albums, just, just they were those moments of art for me. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good description of, the, uh, of that record because it's, it's called Transformer because it's about transformation. It really does turn you into some other kind of energy. It uses energy to do that. And uh, in answer to your question, I, I think that I just have one, uh, maybe the first time that I realized the um, power of words uh, uh, to change you and change the world was uh, when I was eight years old. Um, and I was, and this is a story that's in a film that I made called Heart of a Dog. And it's a story about, um, uh, walking, uh, uh, taking my little twin brothers home on a, uh, across a frozen lake, and they were in a little stroller, and I was, uh, thought I would, I'm going to take them over to the island and show them the moonlight, and so we skated over there, and then right close to the island, um, the ice was very thin, and the ice broke, and the stroller just sank out of sight, and I was stood there on the, on the ice and just my very first thought was, mom's gonna kill me. <laughs> and I took off my coat and my hat and I, was, and I, I dove down into the water and, and I grabbed uh, one of my brothers and out of the stroller and threw him up in the ice and he's like, ah! And then I, then I uh, dove down again, but I couldn't find the stroller and because it had slipped down the, the slope of the island, down farther down under the ice. I came back up, I was like, oh, I can't find it. And I, and I uh, forced myself to dive down again and I went way down under and I p found the stroller and he was strapped in and I pulled the strap out and grabbed him and ran uh, back home with these two screaming little twins. And I ran into the house and um, my mother was there and I, I, I told her what had happened. And she waited, you know, just like a couple of beats and she said, um, I didn't know you were such a good swimmer. <laughs> and such a, such a good diver. And uh, not a word like, what were you thinking? You almost killed your little brother, you know. No, I was a hero. I was almost a murderer, <laughs> was a hero, because she did that. And I thought, that just saved my life. I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn that, how to, how to do that for people. And so uh, uh, 
I, I saw what words could do, and I, I really wanted to learn to shape them. So that was uh, my... So I have my mother to thank for that. <laughs> and I think that was a perfect question to end on and a perfect answer. Laurie Anderson, thank you so much.